What's up, everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean. And today, as you can see, once again, I got a very special guest for you guys. This is TJ Ta Ooh, TJ Chapman, my bad. Goes by TJ's DJs on Instagram. He's manager currently for Trap Beckham and BOB. Uh, this man's just, he's been in the game for a minute, so there's a wealth of knowledge. So I'm just going to get right into the interview and you'll be able to learn some more about his credibility as things go, but uh, trust me, there's gonna be a lot of value out of this one. Uh, first and foremost, hey, thank you, TJ, for even doing this in the first place. No, I appreciate you, man. I, I was wondering if I was gonna get a call. I seen all the others. I was like, well, dang, what about your boy? <laughs> and uh, so it was just ironic, you know, how we connected and everything. So I appreciate you reaching out. Um, I definitely, I definitely watch what you do, and I know a lot of my peers like what you do. So. Um, I, I'm glad to be on with you. So, I, hey, man, it's it's an honor to hear that, man. Like just to just to like get into things, right? You're you're a manager. You're you're successful by so many people's standards right now. But how did you start in the game? Did you, start, did you come in as a manager? Did you even know you want to do music? Where that where that come from? I mean, I came in as a, a DJ. Um, I started DJing when I was in uh, junior high school and then um, ended up going to college in uh, Florida. I'm from Detroit and Ohio, between Detroit and Canton, Ohio. Dope. And then I moved to Tallahassee to go to Florida A&M, FAMU, to go to uh, college. And then that's where I met Kurt. Uh, uh, I met him my first day uh, at FAMU, actually. Uh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've known him <laughs> for 30 years. Uh, that's crazy. Um, but... <clears throat> so when I moved to FAM, I uh, started DJing down here. And, and then it just went for me DJing house parties to DJing uh, campus events and DJing a big fr fr fraternity and sorority events to DJing the clubs. And then next thing I know, I got asked to come on the road uh, and DJ with an artist named Beatmaster Clay D, who was like a Florida legend, Miami bass legend. And it just went for me being his road DJ to his role manager, um, to his manager. And I always wanted to be in business and I love DJing and I love music, um, but I wanted to be on the business side of things. I moved to Tallahassee to go to SBI, uh, the School of Business at FAMU. So that, that was my whole goal anyway. But so it's just like figure out which business it, it was going to end up being. Mm -hmm. So how did yeah. Was it what did you really learn from that first relationship and that first experience going out on the road and stuff like that? You know, <clears throat> hey, that's a funny question. Um, I mean, I, I I I learned how to survive. I learned how to make it. I learned so much uh, uh, about being in the business and stuff that was required. But I tell you, the most important thing that I learned is, you know, as a young person wanting to be wanting to get in this music business. Um, and so many of us had the same aspirations and, and, and we're just hungry and, and eager, um, man. And this is a business where people will take advantage of you so bad. Yeah. And, and so the most important thing that I learned is, you know, <clears throat> everybody ain't as nice as they seem. Uh, everything ain't necessarily good. It looks good. Ain't good. Um, and you have to figure out how to pick and choose and, and deal with those situations, uh, because being so eager and being so hungry and just wanting to get on and just wanting to be like, um, man, people going to take advantage of you. And, uh, I definitely, uh, got taken advantage of. He, you know, no names necessary, but is it possible for you to maybe share one of those particular experiences where you were looking back and you're like, man, if I was thinking differently, it wasn't so in the bright eyed young phase, I, I would have never did that. I mean, something as simple as uh, there being a, is a historic event that started here in Tallahassee. It was Kappa Luau. Uh, it was an annual event. It, was, it, it, it grew to, I mean, man, craziness. But the first Kappa Luau, um, the person I was working with uh, worked it out with the Kappas and everything. So, you know, they were going to DJ the Luau. Uh, uh, provide the sound 
uh, for the performances and, and, and the DJ. And, and then they were doing the after party uh, um, and written out the venue. And so me being uh, Mr. Helpful Henry, um, and wanting to help everybody, you know, I, I let this person talk me into, first off, renting all the sound equipment and putting it in my name for the event. Um, I just wanted to be down. And uh, so it was like, shoot, anything that I could do to be down and, 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 and get cool, then that's, that's what I was trying to do. I, I didn't think about the other stuff. And so I rented all the sound equipment that everybody used for the performances that it was used for the DJ. I rented out the club for the after party uh, um, and everything. And I tell you, man, I, I, I got jerked over. I, ne I never seen none of that money back. Golly. And I was just a young college student, you know what I'm saying? Just, yeah. just trying to, trying to get on, man. Trying to figure it out. Trying to figure it out, and man, I still got them uh, 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 outstanding bills. That <laughs> <laughs> uh, stuff, but you know, the funny thing is, um, you live and learn. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And and from all that stuff, and from being taken advantage, it was a whole bunch way more than that. But uh, uh, learning, learning that stuff, it, it it taught me how to better deal with people and how to better deal in situations where I feel a person isn't right. Mm. You know, you don't necessarily have to say something just because you see it. Um, when all situations, always understand what is it that you want to achieve from this relationship or what you want to get out of this relationship or business venture or partnership or whatever it is. And if whatever reason you realize that those people ain't necessarily right and they, um, and they are trying to take advantage or get over on you, you know, as long as you realize it and can see it, you can still use the situation to your advantage and you can play it against them. Um, when you don't say nothing, they get more and more careless uh, with it because they don't think that you're smart enough to figure anything out. And uh, so I've, I've, I've used plenty of situations to my benefit that I knew wasn't right for me just because I knew what I was dealing with going in and what I wanted to achieve and get out of it. Mm. Mm. So that's like really looking at situations where, you know, we look at fame or capital gain. Those are like the two main measurements that people look at. But you're saying, you know, it might be a, a scenario that might not be great financially or a good look. Right. Quote mm -hmm. unquote, but there's some way that you see it could benefit you, whether it's a relationship or whether it's just knowledge that you learn, something like that. Or oh, put you in position to make that next move or whatever it is, you know. At, at the end of the day, you got to remember it's, it's, it's really a game of chess mm -hmm. and you got to uh, uh, be strategic with all your moves. Um, I mean, man, we play chess so many times, not, not even in this situation, just in situations with the labels and everything else. Um, but, but like, you got to be really smart and you got to think a lot of this stuff out and understand how it works so you can best benefit. Mm. So, I mean, when I hear something like that, and being able to take advantage of those those situations on the way that might not look good in the short term, you really have to understand what your goal is, your greater goal is to even do something like that, right? You got to see the big picture, and 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 I tell you, that's the biggest problem a great majority have. They they so small minded and short sighted mm -hmm. um, that they don't see it. They don't even understand what the big picture is. They're so caught up in perception and how they perceive things to be from what they think other people are doing that they're just so wrong uh, uh, and misguided to begin with. Mm. So when you say think other people are doing, that just, like there's an ignorance when people, when it comes to just dealing with like the music industry or entertainment in general, just from like when you're a little kid, right? There's not even getting real deep about it. It's just like when you're a little kid and you're saying stuff on TV, you have no idea that it's nowhere near like the magic it is. It's a real industry, right? It's a real business. So, like, what was a moment that you, or what are some of the bigger moments for, for you when it came to you, like, realizing, like, oh, this is how this shit really works? Uh, man, um, one of my first major deal, I did my first major deal was with an Island Records in 1993. It was an artist named Prince Raheem. He was out of Miami. He was the first uh, solo Miami-based artist to get a, a, a major deal. Um, once again, 
But once again, boy, I'm telling you, I was that nice guy. I was so happy to have a major deal. I think I, I think I was um uh twenty. I was twenty two. I was okay. twenty two, and um and dog, I just wanted to be everybody's friend, bro. Like. <laughs> I just wanted I just wanted to get along with everybody. I wanted everybody to like me. I wanted to be their friend. I wanted to go above and beyond. Um, but man, I became the scape a scapegoat for, for for so many people and so many things dealing internally with that major label. And I didn't know how to deal. You know what I'm saying? I didn't I didn't know how to deal. I didn't know how to cover cover my ass. I didn't know. I didn't understand paper trails and and know how that stuff worked and 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 how to use that stuff against them. So my A and R person sat down and, and talked to me one day, and he was like, "Man, I, I see what's going on. I know that you mean good. I know you didn't do that. I know you didn't do this." Um, he was like, "But you have to, you have to understand how to play the game, so people can't throw you under the bus like that." And so you can always have some type of paper trail and documentation so you can, if they do, you can flip it and, and actually reverse it on them. And uh, I had to learn the hard way, but, you know, I I learned how to make notes of every conversation and what was said and dates and times and what was supposed to be done and what wasn't done and, you know, and, and kept a journal. Um, and then one day I ended up uh, having to, because they, like they they made me look so bad, and so one day I had to go ahead and use all that. And uh, he was real cool with Chris Blackwell, who owned Island Records, who, okay. who found uh, Bob Marley and everything. Um, and so I sent an email to Chris, documenting everything, everything, the dates, the times, everything that wasn't done, everything that they were supposed to, everything that they said wrong, and and laid it all out. And you know that person got fired. Sheesh. Um, but but it, 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 it taught me how to deal in corporate business. You know what I'm saying? It taught me how to, uh, uh, maneuver in that, in that corporate system, uh, with people that, that prey on eager beavers like me. Got you. That's, that, that paper trail thing is, is definitely something I think is a, a value for people to learn when it comes to, I mean, you know, that. Most people coming into music, at least on the hip hop side that, you know, that I know a lot of aspiring artists, you know, they're not necessarily even going to school. And even if they are going to school, that that dealing with corporate is different than going to school. Right. Yeah. So that, I think that's a real that's a valuable thing to learn. So when you. <laughs> but, it, you know, but it's different now because you have a paper trail with basically everything. You know what I'm saying? You have a digital trail. Whether it be with the text messages, whether it be with the emails, the DMs, the 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 social, po- whatever whatever it is, there's actually a trace of everything except your phone conversations. Yeah. So nowadays, there's a paper trail with almost with with almost everything. That's right. Really uh, so it's a it, it's a whole lot easier. I know I'm telling my age, but <laughs> it's definitely easier. And so, I mean, you've been in it so long, and I know, I know you've gotten so many lessons. When, when was the first time you were in a management situation where, like, you really felt like the artist was taking off? Was that B.O.B., or was that something earlier than that? I mean, the first time that I was in a, in, in okay, my first situation in management where the artist was really, I mean, all my artists did well. You know, not they, they were more regional, my early on artists. No matter of fact, the first dude that I ever managed, um, he's big time nowadays. He goes by the name of Rob Hardy. Uh, him and Will Packer started a company called Rainforest Pro- Productions here in, oh. in Tallahassee, Florida. And then Will Packer was a DJ in TJ's DJ's record pool. He was a, a, a DJ on the radio station here at, at, at FAMU 90.5. Um, but yeah, yeah, Rob was the first dude that, that I ever managed. Uh, now he's like he's a director and all that director. stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Him yeah. and Will killed a game. Um, and I don't know where I was going and why I even said that. Um, but talking about manager, ask me the question again. Well, yeah, just a, a, a good way to say it is when was the first time you really felt like you were winning and killing it with, in one of your management situations? Well, the first time I felt like I was winning and killing it was was with B.O.B. Okay, gotcha. You know, I, didn't, I never managed T-Pain. 
Um, I tried to sign T-Pain to my label, Wild Style, back in the day. And then I, I tried to come in on the uh, management side also later on mm-hmm. uh, with his with his father, uh, Brother Shahi. Um, <clears throat> but I just, you know, broke the sprung record uh, um, on a national, regional, national basis and and uh, helped get him his deal, gave his music to the a r person, Memphis, to sign him a job records. Uh, but, I, but I didn't necessarily manage him, but that was my first breakout anything and, and, and the world knew it. You know what I'm saying? And and so um, I got so many things that came from my involvement and from everybody seeing and knowing what I did with that. But so, the first time my actual management was Bob, but go ahead. Well, yeah, no, I, I'm glad you managed, managed, uh, mentioned that because like, what would it, t- what does it take to break a record? I know it is it, different as far as, you know, technologies change. A lot of things are always changing. Some things are, uh, things are subjective to the artist, all that stuff. But in general, like, what can you say as far as when you, what you learn from breaking a record? And, and now you've, you know, been around several records that have broken. Shit, several. B.O.B. has 14 of the uh, RIAA certified now. That's just one <laughs> artist, brother. That's just <laughs> one artist now. Behind you know, you plaques on the wall. Uh, I, I see an Australia plaque over there with five certifications. I see this Canada plaque with eight certifications. <laughs> you know, we worldwide now. Uh, um, but yeah, my fault. I mean, in a rough. It's just more than a couple. Hey, for yeah. sure, for sure. But, um, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, okay, so are we talking about in today's, uh, uh, with today's music, as far as, as how to break it today? Because it was like different it. back in the day. Definitely, totally different back in the day. Uh, but today. Like what you say today, and, and maybe all right. how it's different. Okay. I mean, the biggest thing for me um, is, is it's like, it's like you, you got some people to come from the old school um, of working and, and setting up and breaking records. And then you have people to come from the new school um, that are more digital, social media driven content, uh, influencer uh, uh, driven. Um, for me, I like to use a combination of both okay. because when it comes to these songs, you don't know. I mean, you can have a, a I mean, I got an awesome ear. Um, and I can hear a record and I can tell you what it is, but <clears throat> I don't always know what's going to connect with the people. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so, so many times you have to figure out how to put the music out there and, and, and give it life to, to even see. Mm. Uh, so with breaking records nowadays, I mean, the quickest way uh, is streaming. You know, getting on Spotify, getting on Tidal and, and, and Apple Music and, and all these various streaming platforms. And and it's one thing to be there, but there's hundred millions, uh, however many songs there besides yours. So now that you're there, people have to find you. So the, the best way for people to find you and discover you and the best way for your music to spread when it comes to streaming is playlisting, mm-hmm. getting on these various playlists. Uh, a lot of people get the playlist and stuff confused. They really don't understand it. They don't know what the word means. Um, <clears throat> and when you start talking playlisting uh, and just using Spotify, for example, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's multiple levels of, of playlists. Most people want to start at the highest level and go for your rap caviars, which is the largest playlist there is. Um, if you get on that playlist, you're going to be on that playlist 30 to 60 days and from being on that playlist, you're going to get millions of streams. Mm-hmm. And um, so everybody wants that, you know, because that it, shit, you get on, on rap caviar, you gone. You out of there. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, you can't be on all these top uh, on these top playlists. And, and when it comes to playlists, and I was just talking about the different levels, you got to understand who puts these playlists together. Uh, and those are called curators. Curators are like the modern DJs. They're like the modern A&Rs. These playlists are like the new modern global radio stations, mm-hmm. you know. Um, but you got the curators, and the curators are the ones that put the playlists to the get- together, and that's who you reach out to to get your music on these playlists, where there's going to be different levels. The biggest playlists across the board 
are, are the Spotify curated playlist or even on Apple Music, the Apple Music curated playlist, the playlist that they curate themselves. They have different people in the building that are responsible for uh, uh, picking the music for those playlists. And it's up to you to get on their radar. It's up to you to try to find out who they are and build relationships with them so you can get on these playlists. But if they don't know you and you haven't really don't have nothing going on with your record, they're just not going to throw you on the top playlist like Rap Caviar. So then how, where, how does that work? Well, then there's other levels of playlists. So then you got playlists that are ran by different brands whether it be a, 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 a magazine or, or your favorite drink um, or whatever it is, uh, but then they have those levels of playlists. Then you have smaller levels of playlists. There might be individual DJs and, and, and key people like that, and then uh, uh, um, your favorite blog sites. Everybody has playlists nowadays, and it's just a matter of finding out who the curator is for each of those playlists. And then you start at the lowest level playlist, which is just people like me and you. You know what I'm saying? Your friends, your mom might have her little workout playlist that she has her favorite songs to. Your dad might have his his his, his Saturday barbecue playlist that he, that he puts the songs on whenever he's cooking out on Saturday. He's going to run that playlist. Um, but the lowest level are the easiest playlists for you to get on. But so many people sure. neglect that, and they're so concerned with getting on these top playlists um, that they really don't stand a chance to get on right now to begin with, um, that they don't even try to get on the lower. And so the key is getting on these lower playlists, step into your friends, step into your family, step into all your followers and getting them to add your music to their playlist. The that the, the personal playlist that alone shows activity with your music. And that activity is seen by the Spotify algorithm. You know what I'm saying? And so when they start seeing activity, it's not a matter of the levels, it's, it's the activity. And when they start seeing the activity, you getting on these different playlists, then their algorithm is going to start adding you to playlists itself. You know what I'm saying? But so many people shoot for the top and don't realize and, and don't target all these other levels of playlists. So streaming, that's, that's one of them. You know, so that's just one example from the streaming side. But streaming is so key. Uh, another thing is probably one of the top uh, forms of marketing right now uh, is influencer marketing. Everything is about the socials, you know, and I think fans, consumers, uh, DJs, shoot, everybody has such a short attention span nowadays because of social media and everything just moves and comes so fast. Um, I say everybody has ADD. So when it comes to pushing out a, a new song, um, to these people, you know, you can't just, okay, make a post with the song in the background and now you posted that and you think that's going to stick. No, there's a million other songs that's coming out today on somebody else's socials the same exact way. And so you have to figure out how to get this stuff to stick in the, in, in the people, stick with the people, uh, um, until they, until they remember it, till they know it, till they fall in love with it. And, Influencers are one of the best ways to do that. Um, you can pay an influencer to go ahead and do something with your product, uh, whether it's a, a, a song, just say it's a song. Okay, now you pay it, whether it's a big twerk girl, that all she does is twerk, but she has millions of followers that, that watches all her twerk videos. Okay, well, yeah, they're not watching her to hear your song, but they're watching that. And when they're watching that, they're hearing something. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And as long as they hearing it, that's good. And it's just all about the repetition. And so you get a big influencer. Okay, so we, we had a big influencer do something. He posted, but because he posted it, this person posted it. Next thing I know, it's on World Star. You know what I'm saying? So that, that influencer video uh, um, had a good 10 million views. Um, so all them views, they heard the song. Mm. They might not realize they're hearing the song. They might not realize what it is, but it's the repetition. It's, it's, it's getting them familiar. Okay, then now you have another influencer do something. You know, and then all of a sudden, it's, they, they're hearing that same song again. I had an artist call me the other day, and he's a rapper now. He's a rapper. He's a street rapper. But he called me and rapped every word of my artist, my other artist, uh, Trap Beckham's verse. Um, and he knew it, not because he tried to learn it. Yeah. But because there's so much activity going on the socials with that song in the background, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. That he just automatically learned the words, not even trying. And that's what I'm talking about, the repetition. Um, you know, so the influencers are really good. Uh, and it's a great way to break your records because it's getting it heard. And it's not requiring the radio. It's not requiring the DJ to play it. Um, and you get the right influencer to do it. Uh, you'll see, you'll see everything grow. You'll see, okay, not only did that person get 10 plus million views, but the artist's Instagram followers shot up. Poof. You know what I'm saying? The stream spike. Poof. And it's like, okay, there's a huge ground swell all because this one person made a video. You know what I'm saying? And so all that stuff helps. Um, so that's the influencer side. You're trying to figure out ways to keep people, um, keep putting your song, keep putting your product or your brand or whatever it is in front of people so they keep seeing it, they keep hearing it. Um, then another way, you know, is challenges. Because once again, with the social media, it's all about content. And um, back in the day, I could just post one, 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 one video or one whatever, and, and, and people it would stick with people, but nowadays I can't. So if I'm releasing a single, I'm trying to figure out a way that I can have at least three weeks of content built up. So every day I can keep dropping something with that record. So they keep hearing. And so that's content that I create. So now I'm jumping back to the, uh, uh, the challenges, the challenges are content with your music or whatever your product is. These are, this is content generated by fans and users. Mm -hmm. This is content that you don't have to create. It's created for free. Mm-hmm. And so they're posting it on their stuff uh, uh, or, or if they're using a, 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 an app like Triller, which is great for challenges. It's man. Triller, well, Triller, app, you, Triller, like T-R-I-L-L-E-R? Yeah, and you see all these people make videos with Triller. Okay. Man, the Triller, man. Man, shout out Triller, man. I love y'all. <laughs> um, you know, like just say the new single we did. Um, and, and we got the challenge going. But on Triller, it's the feature challenge. Um, I think it's 900 plus videos. I need to look again. It might even be more now. Um, but it it was a few million views. It was 3.4 million views of the challenge videos. Hmm. So there's 3.4 million times that people heard the song, whether they was trying to hear the song or not. And so all these things are helping you get people, you know what I'm saying? Um, familiar. So the challenges um, you just repost their content, you know what I'm saying? So now you're showing love to the fans and, and so they loving you cause you posting their stuff. So when you post they they're going to repost it again in their stories at least. Um, but this is all content now that you have every day from other people that you can just post at your own song. Boom, 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 boom. And so it, it's, it's, it's just sticking, you know? So, okay. So now we hop from that side. Are uh, you about to say something? No, yeah, yeah, I was just saying dope because what, what one thing I hear constantly from you is really I break it down into active and passive listening. Like that active, like they're going to the song or the videos, the content might focus on the music, but then still hearing it subliminally in all these other ways too. So it sticks. Like, and I and I know it works because I remember the first time, like you said, that artist did. First time I realized that happened to me with a song was actually like Usher's, like. Uh, if you're feeling your body, like somebody, like the... Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. It, I know. Yeah. And I, like, just on the radio when I was a kid, and I let, sang the whole song through, and I was like, I didn't even know I knew that song. And mm-hmm. it, you know, I, just, I understand how that happens as well. And so people have traditionally done that with radio, you know what I'm saying? But now with social media, you can do the song, same thing, but you can control it. Yeah. You know? uh, um, so now I'm going to hop from the the influencer, influencer and, 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 and the socials and all that stuff. And I'm going to hop to the DJs. Um, you know, so many people nowadays forget about the DJ. So many of these young artists, uh, because of social media and, they, and, they, and then becoming social media stars and celebrities, you know, they may be able to bypass the DJs at first. And and so many of these other artists watching how these new artists are getting on, they thinking that that's the wave, so they following it too. The DJs are still so important and so key. Um, you know, socials are beautiful, the streaming is lovely, um, but you still need to, you still want the streets. 
You know, you still, if it's that type of record, you still need it played in the club. You still need it on these mixtapes. You still need the DJs playing it in their mix shows. You still need these relationships. You know, even more importantly, uh, what about when you don't have a a, a breakout record? Mm. And then what you going to do? You can't do nothing and you can't go run to them then. You know, so you need to build the relationships with these DJs so they can support you now uh, uh, as you're trying to win or even when you're not. But because you built that relationship and they and, and they like you and they mess with you, then they, they support you. Um, I remember uh, Trinidad James. All go to everything. You know, it broke uh, on socials. You know, it, it broke with the video and, and went bananas. And I tell you, um, it broke so big, so fast. You know, he really didn't build his foundation in Atlanta with the DJs. Yeah. And so after that all go with everything record, he not he like like I go do interviews with my other artists and we just be sitting there talking and they be talking like how he never came by the station, even when the record was hot. You know, and so when he wasn't hot, you know, he 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 he, he couldn't go back to him like that. You know what I'm saying? And and so many people don't understand the importance uh, uh of that. And these people, these people take it personal. Um, but the DJs, man, they're everything. And, um, you know, they're the front line for me. You know, all my records, for the most part, have been broke by the DJs. And, and if I didn't have them, then I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be able to do none of the stuff um, that I'm able to do or, or, or have done. Uh, but the DJs are very important. You know, okay, a lot of people tell me they don't know how to get to the DJs or who the DJs are. You know, I think all oh, that's just so lame. Um, you got social media right now. Right. And really, all you got to do is find a DJ. Find a DJ. Whoever's a popping, you ain't got to know nothing. Whoever whoever the popping DJ is in your city that you hear them shouting out on the radio or whatever, you ain't got to do nothing but go find him on Instagram. Mm-hmm. And then you can do something as simple as going and looking at who he's following. DJs a lot of times follow DJs. You know what I'm saying? So you can go look at who he's following and and go through his follower list and click on each DJ that he's following. You know what I'm saying? And go to their profile and follow them. And, you know, if if you want to and you're not feeling lazy today like you might feel a lot of the times, you can also on their profile see a little button that says email (laughs) or text. Huh? Yeah. Or message. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you can easily send them a message in the DM with your song in the link, hint, hint, and then go back to their profile after you send the message and then click the email button. And then when it pops up in your email program, you post paste the same thing in there with the same damn link. All right. And then you copy their email address. And after you copy their email address, you hit send. And then you go to your notepad in your phone on your computer and you paste the email. And you can do that for each one. And before you know it, you have a full email list in whatever city, in whatever area you want. So all y'all with that stuff talking about what y'all can't do and that what you don't know, man, y'all are just lazy and you don't even try. I just gave you some super game. Uh, but most of y'all don't even want to put forth the effort. That's so you know true right there. Like, and, and that, that same applies to influencers and other type of people you're trying to find. I have a lot yeah. of people asking mm-hmm. how do you find influencers. And it's not even a, it's not even something you can really answer for somebody. It's like, because what's the type of influencer that likes your, your type of music? You, but you but you got to do the work of all that. That, that process right there, you got to go through that process. Unless you're going to pay me a hefty sum, that's not what I do. But if I was going to do it, nah. you would pay me a hefty sum to find it for you because that's a real... Like it takes time, yeah. You gotta go do it if you want it. So that's, but it's easy though. It's not even like it's a game. It's just tedious. It's just tedious. That's but it. it's simple. A month. Listen, you can train a monkey to do it. <laughs> Straight up. Yeah. But it's just tedious, and most people don't want to take the time. And it really don't have to be even as tedious as it sounds if you know how to use technology. Hmm. You know, and and I'm just gonna give y'all some more games. So yeah, I told you to go and DM them the message. I told you to go and send them the email. But did you realize that, you know, if you have an iPhone, there's a thing called uh, um, the little the little auto text thing, mm. you know? And so that whole little sentence or phrase that you're going to send them in the DM and, uh, and, and in the email, you can create an auto text entry 
in your in your iPhone. You just go to what is it, general, then go to keyboard, then go to the text uh, uh, auto. I forgot what it's called in it, the uh, text correction, auto text. But then go in there, and then you just put the phrase in, and then just create an abbreviation, whether it's whether it's two letters. Mm-hmm. And every and when you go to them DMs, you just type that two letter, and then it's gonna fill out the whole sentence with the link and everything in there. You click through to the email, you type them two letters again, it's gonna fill out the email and you hit send. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And 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 so it can all be effortless. But once again, y'all gotta uh, make the effort. So okay, so now then I was talking about the DJ standpoint with breaking records. You know, like there's so many ways that you can go at it. Um, and then an old school street method, you know, getting out in the streets, passing out CDs, even though they're not as effective as they used to be and, 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 and not useful in a lot of situations, but they still are useful in some, okay. you know, so I still think it's good to have some CDs on you um, to be able to pass out, depending on what kind of event you at. Um, uh, making sure you go to the barber shops and the hair salons and making sure they have the music, go to the little corner stores and gas stations and making sure they have copies of the music to give out on the counters, you know, old school posters. Um, but the standard old school street promo. Mm. And then last but not least, um, your, your social media uh, promo and marketing. Mm. Um, not, the, not the content and the influencer stuff I was talking about, but more or less advertising. Um, man, Facebook is the cheapest most cost effective way that you can advertise nowadays um and then facebook owns instagram and and so it's like man between the facebook and instagram marketing and promo uh you can put your stuff out and i and i know you talked to jen so i don't need to say too much because he's the guru uh but between all that stuff it puts your music in front of people that's not even checking for you or even if it is like 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 and 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 people don't realize you know, you can set all this up through Facebook. You can use the Facebook as business manager and 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 uh, 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 target and your ads. Uh, but the one one option that you can get through Facebook that you can't get through Instagram, but it's your Instagram ads that you're setting up through Facebook, is you can target your ads at uh, uh, at anybody that has engaged with your Instagram account in the last twelve months. You know, so just because somebody liked it or looked at a video, you know, they might have forgot about you. And it's not that they ain't interested. They just don't know and they haven't seen anything. It's and it's funny to me. It's funny to me how many artists feel like advertising is cheating. They want to be organic man. and advertising isn't organic. Well, you know how crazy y'all sound, man. You think Apple says that when they drop a new damn iPhone? Yeah. Huh? All oh, every brand. Uh, um, You think you think. Uh, Atlantic uh, says that with Cardi B. No, they put millions of dollars into the marketing to make sure they're putting it in front of everybody. Yep. You know, but you have to put it in front of people so they can see it in the first place to make that decision whether or not they want to listen. Yep. And they, it just trips me out how 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 they they feel like it's cheating or or, or it's not right. And man, that is business one oh one. At the end of the day. You have to figure out with your music how you go. You first off, you got to find a place for it to live. Mm-hmm. Number two, you got to figure out how you're gonna give it life. And I can't tell you none of that for sure. I'm gonna shoot at all these methods to try to find the right one. And if all of them work or whatever, that's the more the merrier. But I'm 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 not limiting uh, uh, my odds you know, uh, in, in breaking this record. I'm going to try to expose it every way possible. I'm going to use all the methods that I told you to make sure I expose it to people uh, till I find something to catch uh, and this record actually gets life. It's weird that in the marketplace today, is, there's this big pushback or desire to be organic as if it makes things pure, <sighs> right? And, I don't, and, 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 and organic and marketing don't necessarily go hand in hand like because at the beginning it has to be artificial i don't care if you didn't pay any money but i asked you the fact i asked you to listen to my song personally is me putting in some artificial effort to get you to listen like you want to you want to start or spark some organic that's what you want your artificial marketing to do but you got to get like that ball rolling and 
like you have there's so many people that are like i'll do a video about an artist on, on the channel for example and someone might be like oh man this is fake or their industry plan or they paid or they had money and it's like you're talking about them for the methods they use but they're on they're where you want to get like so try to use those methods as opposed to like i, I don't understand uh, that. but you but they, they they're killing themselves up uh, for, for sure so what, what, what with that being said like what mentality or what do you seek for when you look at an artist that you want to manage? Because like, obviously, are you managed B.O.B., right? And I would love to know even how you came on to his situation, because that situation is like unique for me, because it was the first artist that I got to see personally go from like, he was just Bobby to me. He was a dude on the school bus. And then, you know, like dropping out of school, all that stuff. I remember hearing this or seeing all that stuff. And then next thing you know, he like on TV for real and all that stuff. You know, like, how, how did that happen? And what, what did you, what made you actually want to manage him? You know, funny thing is, uh, and I told this story at an event on Tuesday night, um, my boy DJ Funky, he's with the Coalition DJs. He called me, it was August 14, 2006. I was in Atlanta for the core DJ retreat. Yeah. And he called me talking about, man, come, come to the club, come mess with me, man. You don't, you don't hang out with me no more. He was like, I was like, come on, man, stop sounding like that. No, man, you know, so I was like, all right, bro. I'm going to come to the club tonight, you know, and I'm going to hang out with you. And um, so he's the only reason I went to Club Crucial, T.I.'s Club. Um, and and I wasn't there to see no talent. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know it was, a, I didn't know it was an open mic. I didn't know nothing. All I knew was Funky wanted me to come to the club and hang out with him. Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And I wasn't paying no attention to no groups. I wasn't into that uh, that night. That ain't, you know what I'm saying? So, But then all of a sudden this kid performed. And it's like, he got my attention. And I'm bobbing my head. Next thing I know, I'm waving my hand side to side. The next thing I know, I'm singing a song. And I'm looking at myself like, bro, what you doing, bro? What you doing? You know, because I'm, I'm into it. And then I'm asking people next to me, you know, hey, who's who's dude? I, I don't know. Hey, what's that song? Man, I ain't, I ain't never heard that before. So I'm like, okay, these Atlanta radio and D people and DJs. And they don't know who this is. Yeah. So as soon as he got done performing, I walked down to the stage and was like, hey, bro, my name's TJ. You know, what's your name? He was like, B.O.B. Um, I was like, do you have management? And, and the first thing that I seen when, when I was watching him on stage and I was waving my hand from side to side, singing along the song, all I could see in my head was that this was my makeup for T-Pain. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's all I could think in my head. Okay, this your make up for T Pain. This your make up for T Pain. This your make up for T Pain. And uh, and so I went down, hollered at him, asked me he had management. Then he was like, Yeah, he pointed over there. And then next thing I know, here come B Rich walking up laughing. And B Rich managed him, you know, and and uh, um <clears throat> so then we talked. Um, but I asked B Rich, why are you why are you laughing, man? He was like, why are you laughing? He was like, man, why are you like him now? You ain't never like him before. And I was like, what you, oh, what you talking about? I ain't never seen the kid in my life, bro. And I ain't really like B. Rich a whole lot either then. Because uh, he was funny. But, uh, and, and he was like, what you mean you ain't knowing? Man, I used to send you his music. I even tried to pay you to work his record. I'm like, dog, what are you talking about? He was like, man, he was part of the clinic. I was like, hold on. The clinic? He was like, yeah. I was like, bro, the clinic sucks. I ain't really like the clinic, though. He used to try to pay me to work the clinic, promote the clinic, send email blasts out, whatever, anything that I would do for the clinic. But yeah. I didn't like the clinic. <laughs> so I wouldn't take his money and I wouldn't do nothing. Yeah. So Bob left the clinic and when I seen him, it was his first little solo performance as B.O.B., first time he performed Cloud Nine. And I just happened to be there in the, in the building. That was and crazy. went down, talked to him. We, we all linked partnered up a week and a half later, taking meetings, label deal meetings, uh, uh, label meetings uh, with the majors. Uh, a month and a half later, uh, October 3rd, 2006, his contract was signed with Atlantic Records. And it's been history ever since then. We're going on 13 years coming up in August. Dope. Dope. It's, it's funny to hear that, that was Cloud Nine because that, that was that joint for me back in the day. I, was, I, was, I used to play that. Yeah, I used to play that one a lot, a whole lot. Was that, um, I remember hearing, like, back then, like, that he, was the Crucial, that night at Club Crucial, did he have the guitar with him that night? No, no, he didn't play the guitar yet. He hadn't I, even started playing guitar yet then. Okay. He did play guitar at Club Crucial another night. Okay. It was a core DJ, he came in there with the band, 
playing the guitar, rocked out. Um, but the guitar was something that he learned. Um, and we, matter of fact, when he got signed, he got signed by Jim Johnson, uh, label Rebel Rock, and Jim has his situation through Atlantic. So we, we ended up moving to Miami, and he would always be in the studio with Jim. And Jim used a lot of guitars, and he had a guitar player named Frank, Franco. Okay. And uh, Bob just 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 messed mess with, with Frank, and then Bob started taking guitar lessons on his own, uh, uh, acting class. Like, he took all this stuff. As a, as a 17-year-old kid now, with his own money, he wanted to perfect his craft and his art. So he took, he took acting classes, he took guitar classes, he took singing classes wow. to perfect himself as an artist. And so you were saying it was funny because you saw him, you know, at the one level and then and all the way up to the one time where at the point where it just skyrocketed. But it was so much work put in in between, you know, nothing on you didn't come out till 2010. He signed in 2006. Yeah. So in that four year period, we dropped seven mixtapes and went on seven different tours. Mm -hmm. So all those were foundation building techniques to build Bob you know, to build his fan base. Our whole philosophy was just building fans one person at a time. And, uh, and, that, and that's just the way we went about it. Um, but, yeah, so all these things laid his foundation, you know. And so when he finally had that big record, he had been on the cover of all the magazines. Every, 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 every outlet, every media outlet had Bob next for years. It was just, okay, okay, when is it going to happen? You know what I'm saying? But he was, he was, he was the darling of all the media. <clears throat> that's, I, but it was the process. Go ahead. No, that's, that's perfect. Because I would like to, I mean, you know, you're the perfect, perfect person to ask because for me, you know, he's such a unique artist, right? And like, he, he's very diverse and so many artists want to be diverse. Like so many people say they want to be diverse and they not, they aren't diverse for real, but he is like truly diverse. And I remember like, you know, or the cloud nines and things like that. And, and then, you know, the, uh, the it was a track that was, that, that would be on the radio it is everywhere. And then I'll be in the yeah, sky. Exactly. And those tracks were like, some of them were a little bit smoker. Some of them were a little bit more Atlanta, uh, the cater a little bit hood. Then he'll have the ones that are more poppy or Andre 3000 esque. But right. by the, when he blew up with the nothing on you, right. That was straight pop. And what I saw, cause I was just, you know, but it, but it wasn't though. Well, if, I, if, 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 if it wasn't Bruno Boyce on there, it could have been Urban, and it went number one Urban. True, but like so, it's just a universal sound. But go ahead. But from a, like a a, a a kid's perspective, and I'm just reading YouTube comments and stuff like that right, right, right. at the time. Like, and then you had the airplanes and stuff like that. Like that that introduced him to such a pop. Uh, world. And then what I started to see, just watching as more music got released from the comments perspective, I would see he might do something back more on the, you know, Atlanta hood or type side sometimes. And then the pop fans will be calling him a sellout. And then I'll see, you know, and then the, yeah. the you know, and then when he's doing the, the pop stuff, the hood people are looking at him one way. Like, well, what is that like from the inside? Dog, on, on some real shit right there, it's like, it's like as an artist, you work all your life to become a, a superstar. That's what you want. That's what you're working for. Um, Bob come from the hood. You know what I'm saying? He don't come from no suburban night place or fam. You know, he come, he come, he come from Decatur. He come, and and that's what he how he grew up. Um, it just so happened that he makes worldly music. Yeah. And and so when he got on, he just made universal song. He 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 never wanted to be a pop guy. You know what I'm saying? And 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 really that don't it it don't even sit well uh with him. You know, a lot of people always wonder why, like, yo, man, you you, you know that that's what every rapper aspires to be. But you know, he 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 wanted to be embraced by his his, his people. And he just he just made really big music, and you know it it ended up becoming it's a gift and a curse, mm -hmm. having all these different types of fans and being able to make all different kind of records, um, and having all this success. The fan base is so huge and so diverse, 
um, between the age groups to the cultures to to everything, um, it's almost impossible for him to make something nowadays that's going to go well with everybody. Mm. And and so then it it it, it, it you know becomes something that you have to deal with, and and people on the outside really don't really don't get it, mm. and they don't understand. And and when you the artist. You just wanted to make records. Yeah. You never, never tried to, you know what I'm saying? Never tried to do it. The only, the only poppy record that was on the album that, that was like, okay, damn, this, this thing is, 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 is pop, too pop, uh, was Magic. You know, uh, uh, him with Rivers Cuomo. You know, it went double platinum. Uh, it might be triple now, but, um, you know, that was the pop record. Yeah. Um, we did airplanes on BT with Keisha Cole singing it. You know what I'm saying? And so if you had Keisha on there over Haley, now that song be has an urban feel. Mm. There were universal records of what they were. Pop. It, 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 it was what, what was put on them that made them, it, it took them that route. Mm. Yeah. But yeah, so but he never tried to do that. And, and so, you know, so it's been a gift and a curse, and 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 to be honest, it's something that you know that he that he that he deals with, like, and it's and it's crazy. It's crazy to, from a management standpoint to to know no matter what he does, and no matter how good it is, it it, it don't matter. There's gonna be a segment of people that's gonna hate and bash, you know, and and it's just like wow, boy, that shit that shit's hard. It's weird. That's why I was asking because I was so deep into it, and I would literally I like I. Because oh, hold on. Before you say that, before you hold on, before you say that, let me say this because I just have for an artist that gets confusing. You okay. know what I'm saying? Okay, so you're making this sound, and then your fans start talking about, hold up, now nah, you selling out, and this and that, 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 that and, you, and this ain't what you're trying to be. So now you're trying to make something to please them, but when you do that, you know, then you got these people over here now bashing you, and it's just like, okay, should it, damn if I do, damn if I don't. That's exactly what I was actually about to say. I was saying. Well, go ahead, dog. Okay, I know I interrupted. That, that was it. No, that was, oh. it. I was like, I, it. was confusing me because I have a diverse like type of music that I, I I like because of just how I grew up. There would be so many different types um, for my dad, and I, so I could enjoy both sides. And I and then knowing the journey of where he came from and all that stuff, so I would be looking at comments. I'm like, bro, what do you mean, bro? What do you mean? But it it was. It's, I always imagine that was a wild situation. And he came out with no drama, trying to make a point. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there was so many. But, yeah, I always wonder, like, how, like, if it, yeah, what that was. So that's why when I hear artists talk about being diverse, especially when it's truly diverse. Like, some people are stylistically diverse. You can do a lot, but you're still in this pocket. Like, Tory Lane, right? right? He's, right. like, he might, he can write and do anything, but it's stuff that he might write for people and do that stuff that's way outside the pocket but as far as his music he keeps it pretty much in a pocket you know and it has similar or overlapping fan base but like to just do it how bobby did it and I, like he never came out with that rock album that i remember it was talking about at least i didn't catch it mm-hmm. but, and he still got it he got all that music and he got he got a whole bunch of projects that's yeah. you know, all he does is record so, so I, I i imagine he makes so. music a I, lot i just want to know for like for yeah for an artist I definitely wanted to get your opinion and your insight, which you shared a lot, because I think artists don't know what they're, what it actually looks like. We always, they hear the message of organic so much and then they hear the message of it doesn't matter. Just make what you want and you can be diverse and consumers are not as trained for diverse music as you really think. Like they just aren't. (laughs) They aren't. And they're not not, uh, that receptive either. Yeah. Like, it just is what it is. So, though, I really appreciate that. Like, uh, and with track Beth, track Beckham as well. Like, what? How did you come across his situation? What made, like, what made you even decide to take on another artist? You know, with with Trap, it, it was funny because I was in. I, I, we had just finished a, a forty three city tour, I think it was with Bob, mm-hmm. and our last date of, of the tour um, was in Miami. You know, our last date of that tour was in Miami. And, uh, and so everybody left, I was leaving to go home, um, cause it was the last day of the tour, but I, I wanted to unwind. So I didn't leave. I stayed an extra day in Miami. 
everybody else was gone. I wanted to chill out after that, being on the road for two months and on a bus. And uh, so I stayed. And so when I checked in my hotel, there were some guys over there and I was looking at them. And one of them had a, well, they had on Def Jam gear. And I was like, okay, damn, that's, that's okay. Well, no, how they got that Def Jam gear? Because, you know, you just can't find Def Jam gear where you can just go buy it like that. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, but I know he don't look, I know he ain't on Def Jam. I was like, oh, I ain't never heard of him. I know he ain't on Def Jam. So after I got my key, I started walking off. And then the person was like, yeah, I know we in the right hotel because Mr. Chapman in this one. And then I was like, oh, and I looked up and I knew uh, uh, I knew one of the guys with him. And he, he just started talking to me and started walking me to the room, told me they had just got signed by Def Jam, that it was Trap Beckham. And I was like, oh, damn, that's pretty cool. I was like, I didn't know a dude like that. So um, after that, I just started watching his socials. You know, because um, I was like, OK, well, damn, I, you know what? Respect for Def Jam is just coming and just picking up an artist, you know, um, that I'm not familiar with like that. I, was like, I like that. So I just started watching. I was impressed with all the movement, everything going on. Uh, so then one day I got a call um, from a friend of mine saying that uh, the guy who Trap assigned to wanted to meet with me. And uh, so I met with him. Then I met with him in Atlanta. I ran into him in L.A., ran into him back in Atlanta again in Jacksonville. So it was like, OK, well, damn, I can, you know, keep running into him. Uh, we talked. He told me about the deal situation and he needed somebody to come in and and teach them, you know, because uh, um, they didn't know what they were doing. Mm. And so they needed somebody to come in to try to help get the situation straight with Def Jam and as well as just guide trap in the team period. And uh, when I went to hear the music, you know, I was just like, okay, hmm. And I liked the sound. Um, and I just, I don't know why, I just felt like, you know, like, you know, maybe this dude has like the next sound. Mm -hmm. And the way I kept running into Stevie, it was like, okay, you know what? For some reason, I just feel like I'm supposed to do this. And, and I did. <laughs> I'm 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 a big believer in in my gut. Yeah. Um, I I go. I'm a big believer in vibes, uh, on people and in situations. And I always go on my gut. I found just being in the industry and 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 in life, uh, the only times that I've been wrong is when I have went against it. Mm. And so, um, I I I go off my gut, man. And, you know, it just told me, hey, TJ, you know, this is something you're supposed to do. So, and, uh, and and it's funny because everything's really coming together and he's developing uh, um, and he's making great records. And so I'm, I'm actually really excited. Uh, but it was something that initially I did on faith. Dope. Okay. Dope. Dope. Like, and what, break, speaking of like the industry and being signed and things like that, what do you feel like the d biggest difference is for both of these artists are signed, but this artist takes off. This one is in the industry and signed consistently with a situation they're, and they're surviving, they're doing well, but they aren't taking off, taking off. I mean, a lot of times it has to do with team, you know, team is everything. And I can't preach that enough to artists, man, you know, and, 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 and it's funny cause I, I deal with a, I deal with man, so many artists, bro. Like it's, it's crazy. And I, and I, and I just give people advice and tips and tell them how to deal with situations. And so, man, it's, it's, it, it, it's crazy how many artists are in situations with bad management. And the whole reason their career isn't taken off is because their manager don't know what to do or how to do it. They may not be professional. They may not be good at dealing with people. They may not be good at just handling business, you know? Um, and, 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 and it's so sad. Um, and then when your management and your team isn't good, you know, that's kind of a turnoff for the label and it, it, it'll make them stop doing whatever it is they doing, whether it's putting you out on the road, whether it's spending money, like, but y'all got to, realize is these people um these people are inspired by your work ethic and if you're not working and they don't see you out here trying and making things happen and doing things you need to do as an artist 
you know what? They're not inspired or excited and they're going to stop doing whatever it was they were doing and move on to the next artist it is, whether you realize what's going on or not. Hmm. And so that can easily be one of the things your, your management and your team are lack thereof to, it can easily be your work ethic. Hmm. Most of y'all don't want to work. Most of y'all feel like sitting in the studio all day, uh, uh, smoking, drinking, and doing whatever else it is you do is the grind. But really, if you have access to a studio, how hard is that to sit back in a chair and chill out and get drunk and high and, you know what I'm saying, get dances or whatever you got going on in that thing? Um, and then more importantly, it might just be the music. You know? I mean, can nothing make up for the lack of music, but then I, it's like I say that and I contradict myself because we're in a new age. And in this new age, to be honest with you, um, the music is secondary to the people actually uh, liking you. Mm. And that's everything. And so back in the day, it was the music when it came to getting deals. Today, uh, these labels are going after uh, uh, social media uh, uh, celebrities with tons of followers um, that are already pay attention to what they do and, 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 and like what they do. So from the label standpoint, they know you already have some type of captive audience. So it's way easier for them to convert that captive audience to fans and tap into them, uh, and to their buying power. You know what I'm saying? than it is to try to just create all these new fans. Mm. And so that's what they're buying into. And then, you know, even though there's a difference between followers and fans, you can convert those followers to fans, number one. And then even with the followers, you can attach a certain dollar amount per person, you know, to just come up with what, what you can potentially generate. And, that, and that's how they look at these things. And they, like Atlantic is a built-in system, you know. And so between Craig Cameron and Mike Karen, uh, all they do is buy records. They buy records and they got a stockpile of records. Did they buy beats, hooks? And when you come in, depending on the artist and what it is and the sound and style, they're going to go in that vault and pull out some of them hits they had stashed away, waiting for the right time to use them. You know, so once you already have a fan base, it's easy to give you the records and, and push you. It, it's harder uh, um, when you have the music, but the people don't even find you cool. Mm, interesting. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I, that definitely makes sense because from a company standpoint, right, if you already have your system, I can basically calculate based on your numbers what my system would do to you. Like, I know the mm-hmm. yep, yep. Yep. that it'll create. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Interesting. Well, like, all right, so to change directions and kind of like close it out a little bit, really curious the fact that, I mean, you've had, you know, considerable success um, at what you do um, as a manager, right? And a lot of people, not even your level and above, but even people who've had success, but less success than you wouldn't be sharing as much as you do, right? You do the free uh, music reviews, TV, like all that stuff. You, like you listen, you share what, what causes you, to actually be so involved and, and touch bases with artists hand to hand as you do so much? I mean, to be honest, dog, that's what I've done my whole life. And that's how I built my brand. That's how I built who I am and, 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 and everything I'm able to do. Um, you know, I started out with TJ's DJs, which was a record pool and, 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 and grew that. But the thing that made everything take off was when I started doing uh, my conference. And I did a call to Tastemakers Only. It was a conference I did four times a year, every, every quarter. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a platform for everybody. And everybody that you can think of that, that's in Southern rap would come through my event, you know. And, and, and man, it was a launching pad. Like, dog, it, it'll blow your mind. You know, all these Southern artists, it was a launching pad for it. The first time T-Pain ever performed Sprung was at my TJ's DJ's, the first time Gucci Man performed So Icy was at TJ's DJ's. He didn't know the song. You know what I'm saying? He didn't even know the lyrics yet. He forgot the lyrics on stage. Right. You know, uh, uh, the first time Bob performed I'll Be In The Sky was at TJ's DJ's and mm-hmm. Tallahassee Hit The Moon. But I mean, I can go on and on and on and on. And there were so many firsts and so many of these big artists, you know, and, and even an event that I started with Julia Beverly called the Ozone Awards. Uh, that was real huge. Did in 06, 07, 08. Um, but these things were, was, was like the Ozone Awards was uh, aired worldwide on the various MTV networks. 
Mm. You know, so it's like I've always had a platform for helping artists and 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 using the platform and using the relationships and the and and, and the people that I'm tapped into to help grow and, and break their music. And so I've always been given, you know, we just didn't have social media. I wish we did back then. Um, but like, I like to help people. I like to, 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 to coach. Like I just, I like seeing people win, man. I like being involved. I like changing people's lives. I like creating stars. Um, I like doing things that people say, you know, that I can't do. And it's just, this is just what I, what I've always done, man. And I just want to see artists win. I'll give you another example. You know, um, I used to manage K camp. Um, <clears throat> I was with camp and I was behind, I, I get, helped get him his deal with Interscope. And I uh, was one of the executive producers on that Interscope release. Um, but yeah, I was behind the money baby to cut that bitch off, uh, uh, comfortable, you know, all, all those records. And, and, and so I had met his mom, um, when he was 16, she, she, she told me, um, we became friends. Then one day she called me, told me she had a son. He rapped, asked if I give, give him feedback on his music. I was like, cool. Um, I got on the phone with him. The music really wasn't that good. I told him I wasn't feeling the music, what he needed to work on. You know, his, his mom called me back, said, thanks. Um, she said, you know, I don't, I don't know what I said, but it kind of made him a little upset or whatever, but he vowed to keep working until I liked his music. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And he would call me, he would text me or email me or whatever. Hey man, what's going on? Hey, I got this, check this out. Da, da, da. And I was always a mentor to him and his mom. And I was a mentor to him and his mom for years. Um, maybe like four or five before I ever got involved with the management with the money baby and cut her off. But me giving people help, me giving, pr providing value to people, it it, 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 it builds a, a trust factor with them and my brand. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it, with that, it, it enabled me to come in on a situation that was already in place. Mm -hmm. You understand? And the same with the BOB, it was a situation already in place. The same with trap it was a situation already in place. Um, but I know what to do to take whatever it is from here, uh, up here. You know, but it's 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 the giving the information. It's it's helping people out. It 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 provides credibility uh, for me and my brand to be able to move. Uh, and and you know, uh, I mean, it just helps. Shoot, I mean, I, I make money from it. I don't make money from giving advice, but because of the trust built from that, I make money from it indirectly. Mm. You know, uh, people want my services. People want to submit music for my show. People want me to come speak at their event or host or uh, on come in or their project or whatever it may be. So that's why I do it, man. Because um, I like helping people, man. And 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 uh, I feel like I'm blessed from it. Oh, oh. Okay. Last question. What would, is there anything else that you want to accomplish within music, or if it's outside of music, another industry or side product? You know, I don't know in music. It's like I want to do something else, but it's like I'm so good at this and I got so much experience and I know everybody. Yeah. It don't make sense. Um, but, you know, I, I still say I still want to have a, a successful record label um, one day. I mean, I've had labels in the past, I, you know, been involved. I mean, I was one of the founding members and, and uh, one of the owners of No Genre, BLB's label. Um, but I've been in other label situations, have my own label. Um, but I, I, I'd like to have a successful label before I leave this business, uh, before I leave it alone. It ain't got to be a long term thing. It can just be my label and me having some 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 record breaking projects and then I'm cool. Uh, but yeah, outside, I mean, I, I should I like to eat, man. I like to eat. I like to cook. And uh, I would love to just be able to chill out one day and open up a dope little restaurant lounge and uh, and just, just kick back. Dope. Oh, got to have the hookahs in there, though. Got to have the hookahs. <laughs> got to have the hookahs. Yeah. <laughs> All right.
dope, man. I appreciate you once again, man. And hey, everybody, follow TJ at TJ's DJs. That information will be in the description. I'll have his uh, Instagram up on the screen, all that good stuff. You already know who I am, Ram and Sean. Would love to know you guys' thoughts on the interview. Put it in the uh, the comment section below. If you like this video, go ahead and hit the like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not, subscribe. You know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.